The Illinois Fighting Illini have ridden a Big Ten roller coaster under Brett Bielema the last few years. 2022 going up. 2023 maybe dipping back down. Will 2024 have them headed up once again and get over that bowl eligibility hump? Sonny Verma from Locked On Illini joins me next to preview all things 2024 Illinois football. From L.A. to Piscataway. All Big Ten, all year long. This is Big Ten Ten. Which way will the Illinois Fighting Illini go in 2024? What a pivotal year it is for the Orange and Blue to break down all things Illinois football for the 2024 season. We welcome in Sonny Verma from Locked On Illini. And Sonny, when we really start to dive into this season... You kind of had to start by looking back a couple of years, 2022. That's when you really saw the upswing with guys like Tommy DeVito at quarterback with Chase Brown, with Sidney Brown and Devin Witherspoon back there. Really good team. And I think we knew that they'd take a dip, but they dip below bowl eligibility, maybe a little bit more than some people thought, which makes 2024 a big year for Brett Bielema to determine where the direction of the football program is going to go. So let me pose this to you. How impactful is this season to determine what the future of a Brett Bielema, Illinois program looks like? I mean, it's huge. Uh, Josh Whitman, the AD at Illinois had uh, held a media round table a uh, couple about a month back. And essentially he talked about how this program was just a couple games away from having its best three year stretch in the history of uh, Illinois. And keep in mind, Illinois was a founding member of the big 10. Now granted Illinois isn't exactly a storied football program, but that just kind of tells you that, you know, we're, we're close, but right. close is not cutting it in the modern day big 10, especially with the way the big 10 is growing uh, you know, teams that traditionally Illinois can be a little higher uh, than Rutgers. Shiano is killing it with recruiting. Uh, Indiana has all this new energy from Kurt Signetti. Those teams are kind of starting to pass by the cool factor when it comes to, you know, uh, recruits and getting uh, hot prospects coming in. Brett needs to do some work. Uh, five and seven his first year, eight and five his second year, five and seven again last year. And again, you're, you're talking about two or three games that could have gone in any sort of way. If we're talking about three straight bowl games at this point, the arrow's pointing up towards Illinois football. Right now, the fact that we didn't make a bowl game last year, things are wondering. You know, recruiting is doing okay, but it's not to the level that we probably need to compete in the future of the Big Ten. So the only way to get us on the right track is uh you know getting that bowl eligibility you know here next year the year after that just try to be a little bit more consistent and hopefully now that brett's got his guys playing uh that's what we're going to be able to do you talk about those close losses and how they affect the look of your program look at tom allen down the stretch you look at uh, one possession loss after one possession loss, and it cost him his job uh, in the end. So we'll see if that happens down the road with Burt, but obviously we're hoping he stays in Big Ten country. We certainly love him coaching Big Ten football at the University of Illinois. Let's start first with the offensive side of the football when we break down these units. And I, I'm starting to really like what Illinois has on the offensive side. Now, you look at Luke Altmaier at quarterback. Of course, that's where we start when we look at an offense in today day and age of college football and it's a little bit mixed feelings right because there were some high expectations for him coming into the season and he was running around a lot early in the year right part of that might go to the offensive line but he was using his legs a lot to create plays he gets banged up John Paddock the Illinois legend takes over and then Luke Altmaier doesn't really see the field the last couple of games throughout the season what's the confidence level like in a line I nation as him being the guy in Champaign with Donovan Leary maybe on his heels after that good spring game? I think the confidence level is higher in that Illinois locker room than it might be within the national media. Uh, Luke Altmaier, as you said, we had two national games last year. One was against uh, Kansas in like it was a Friday night ESPN game where we got boat raced. And basically Luke Altmaier, uh, in the first four or five games of the season, 
Illinois was really, really struggling with finding out what their offensive line was going to look like. They were shifting guys back and forth. Luke Altmaier was not only our best passer, he was our leading rusher. And that's just not the type of pressure you want to put on a guy who's starting for the first time in his career. Then you, you have the matchup against uh, Penn State, where, of course, Luke Altmaier just, just flat out had a bad game. He had threw yeah. four interceptions in that first half. And for a lot of the national people and a lot of national fans, they saw that and understandably kind of maybe made up their mind on what Luke Altmaier was doing. But if you were paying attention to him in that second half of the season, once that offensive line was figured out, it became a little bit, I would grade it probably above average in the second half of the season. We had Caden Fagan's uh, emergence as a running back, as a consistent guy to you know hand the ball off to and basically take the pressure off Luke Altmaier. Luke was actually a pretty solid quarterback in that second half of the season. Now, as you mentioned, you know, he did get hurt on that last drive against Minnesota, and John Paddock came in and led that game-winning touchdown pass to Isaiah Williams for uh, the victory. And then Luke Almeyer was benched. Not benched. He was hurt the following game, I believe, was against Indiana. And then John Paddock throws for 500 yards. Now, what do you do with that? You know, it, it was one of those where uh, Paddock – to me, for any of your older viewers, reminded me of when <clears throat> Trent Green got hurt in the, with the Rams a, a couple of decades back. Yeah. And this young, back not young, middle-aged uh, backup quarterback came in named Kurt Warner, who was just slinging the ball and throwing for 300, 400 yards every single game. And it was one of those situations where we were because of our poor start to the season, we needed every single game in order to become bowl eligible. And with a hand as hot as John Paddock was, you just couldn't sit him. So, you know, Paddock continued to start. Luke Allmeyer did not sulk in any sort of way. He could have. You know, he's a former four-star himself. But every interview you watch, uh, even the interviews with John Paddock, Luke was basically a very good understudy. He asked questions. What did you see? Why did you do it? And, you know, he just continues to grow. And, again, this is just going to be his second full starting season in college football next year. So I'm actually very comfortable with the quarterback position. But as you said, you know, we do have Leary's, uh, Leary in the, uh, his, the backup role. The quarterback room in general, we've been recruiting at a higher level since we did uh, with the Lovey Smith era. So I think there's a talent in that room now. Maybe a lot like last year. You should feel confident, right? What whoever is taking snaps under center because of what you saw in the spring from, from Donovan Leary as well. Also, Drew Bledsoe and Tom Brady, that ring a bell as well, right? Considering yeah, right. last year's type of situation and comparing that. All right, let's go out to some of these weapons that these quarterbacks, whoever it is, whether it's Luke Altmeyer or Donovan Leary, are going to be throwing the football to. Zachary Franklin, it starts there. Of course, he has a relationship with Barry Lunny Jr., the current offensive coordinator at Illinois. They were together at UTSA for a couple of seasons. Zachary Franklin, oh, just put up a couple of 1,000 yard seasons, 12 touchdowns, 15 touchdowns, respectively, during those seasons. He was the threat in that roadrunner offense during those seasons. Is he the post Isaiah Williams playmaker that is needed for Illinois to really break out offensively this year? Uh, I think the key word there you said was needed. Um, the off the wide receiver room, talent-wise, has been raised since Brett got here. But if you take a look at the guys who were on the depth chart, it was very, very green. You had Pat Bryant, who's the number three last year behind Isaiah Williams and Casey Washington, and he had a very good season for a number three. But it's him starting as a number one, you know, you were kind of basing more on hope than actual production that you had seen on the field. Malik Elzey, a guy that Illinois fans have been excited about for years, one of the highest rated recruits we've gotten in a very long time. He would say, I would say you'd, he had a lackluster freshman season, still immensely talented. And so again, hope is the word that you would use for Elzey. The offensive line is solid. We've got a great running back room. I, we already talked about Luke Altmeyer. The only position that I was kind of unsure about was that wide receiver room. So when Zachary Franklin decided to commit to Champagne, what it gave Luke Altmeyer was a safety valve, like he had last year, Casey Washington. Zachary Franklin's the type of player where you know if Luke is in trouble, Luke can throw it to him and Zachary will make a play. There's no wide receiver in the country that has the career numbers that Franklin does coming into this year. And so that's just kind of what that room needed, a veteran presence and just a guy, a safety valve for Luke Altmeyer to know that he's got one guy who's done this before. 
I think coming into the season when Pat Bryant, maybe before Zachary Franklin transferred in, Pat Bryant was kind of penciled in as that number one guy. And maybe it didn't seem like he was that type of guy that could step up into that role. Like maybe Isaiah Williams or some have had in previous years. Where does do you feel more comfortable with Pat Bryant at the number two role now in this offense? I absolutely do. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, of all the rooms on the offensive side, the wide receiver one was the one I was most unsure about. Yeah. But that was as with Bryant as the number one and, uh, you know, LZ as the number two. But you slot them down one with Franklin as your number one, Bryant your number two, LZ number three. Then we have guys like Hank Beatty who can be the slot wide receiver. Now all of a sudden that becomes a pretty solid average Big Ten wide receiver room, which, again, because as we're going to get to in a little bit, like our offensive line should be one of the better ones in the conference. I think talent wise, our running back room can compete with most in the conference. Really all we need is average on the wide receiver portion. Just someone that Luke Altmaier can, you know, throw to, to keep the defensive, the defense honest. So they don't stack eight in the box. Now let's talk about that running back because Caden Fagan really came on towards the back half of last season. Of course, kind of like Luke Altmaier, right? Injuries maybe derailed his 2023, but he looked really strong, right? This is a big, big 10 type of downhill uh, type of running back here for the Illinois Fighting Illini this season. If healthy, do you think he could be that 1,000-yard bell cow type of running back for the Illini? Absolutely. And, you know, Ted, I'm going to be honest with you. I think we have two, maybe three guys in that locker room who could be 1,000 yard wide receivers uh, next year if injury were to happen. Now, I have to say this because last year, at one point in the season, all five scholarship running backs were hurt. So, you know, that's the thing. There's a, I don't know if there's a bug in that locker room or what it is, but (laughs) that room just needs to stay healthy because it's super talented and nobody more talented than Fagan. And you saw him once he, once, Hit, once he emerged as the running back go-to guy, all of a sudden our season turned around. Caden Fagan has the highest ceiling, but you also have other guys like uh, Josh McCray, who unfortunately had a fantastic freshman year, got hurt the previous two seasons, and there was questions about him possibly wanting to leave just because the opportunity have diminished, but he's really a locker room guy. He's the go-to guy for Brett when we have running back recruits come in they tend to stay with Josh. Josh is a big fan of the program. Um, speaking of uh, recruits, we got four-star Khalil Valentine, who's another kid, super talented. And I do think that should he get the opportunity to be starter, uh, he's a guy who can really put up numbers as well. And again, I haven't even mentioned guys like Jordan Anderson, who was uh, injured in the uh, spring game. Uh, Aiden Lawfrey is kind of the All the guys I've mentioned are like power running backs. Aiden Loffrey basically was the only healthy running back during the spring game, and you saw it. He was catching balls out of the backfield. He's kind of the lightning to everybody else's thunder. And, you know, I kind of mentioned this before. That running back room is really talented. Uh, When you think of Brett Bielema, you think of big offensive lines, good running backs, and that's exactly in year four what we have here at Illinois. And we talked about that passing game, and that's exciting that that could be good, but I think when it really comes down to it with what we're about to talk about with the offensive line, this is still could be some Brett Bielema football, some ground and pound when all is said and done. All right, let's talk about this offensive line because there were maybe issues with the orange and blue front at the beginning of last year. They started to figure it out as the year went on. And then when you look at this year's front, there's a lot to be excited about. And Brett Bielema, you know he loves those big boys up front. So you lose Isaiah Adams and Julian Pearl, but they attacked some of those holes in the line via the transfer portal as well. How about J.C. Davis coming in from New Mexico? He's the highest graded offensive tackle, according to PFF, returning here in 2024. First team, all Mountain West Conference uh, type of performer as well. You have a less experienced uh, Kevin Wingenton coming over from Michigan State. They joined Josh Kreutz at center, who started all 12 games last year, all Big Ten Honorable mention, Josh Kieske over there as well. Another honorable mention guy, uh, Zy Chrysler, two-time All-Big Ten honorable mention, and 24, count them, 24 starts 
at Illinois. Do you believe that this can be one of the best offensive lines in the Big Ten? And do you believe that this offensive line is going to make Luke Altmaier that much better, having this gel, having this cohesion, and having this talent up front to be able to protect him? Absolutely. Um, if any. Thing. This is why I feel like sometimes I might be a homer when it comes to Illinois compared to all the other outlets that you read about. You know, usually you have uh, everything I've been reading has like Illinois projected 13th, 14th, 15th in the conference. I think this offensive line is probably one of the top five or six in the conference. They have been recruiting this position like no other position since Brett Bielema got here, which makes sense. There's no other coach in college football who has produced more uh, offensive line and then into the NFL then Brett and that next offensive lineman that's going to be going to the NFL is JC Davis who you just mentioned uh, he was heralded coming out but now he's at the point where even during the offseason workouts the college coaches can't stop talking about him they really think that he's gotten a really really high ceiling and he's going to be the next guy uh, to hear his name in the NFL draft next year. As you said, you know, we got Kevin Witt Wigington from uh, Michigan State, another Big Ten body with Big Ten talent. Josh Cruz, Josh Cruz was a center who had to win his job last year, and he he was probably the most consistent uh, offensive lineman we had on that roster last year, which says a lot because two of those guys uh, are going to be in the NFL now. Uh, as you said, uh, all Big Ten honorable Um and uh, yeah, Geski, same deal. You know, it's it's a position that's been elevated. It struggled so much in the first four or five games of last season that you're wondering, hey, this is this does not look like what Brett Bielema's teams traditionally look like. What's going on here? But it, eventually, they plugged their right pieces in the right spots. This year, Brett was not going to let that happen. He attacked that. Uh, transfer portal hard and you know he got a guy like jc davis who he thinks he can plug in there in the toughest position on the football field and he's going to make luke altmeyer's life a lot easier let's go to the defensive side of the football that was certainly the strength of that 2022 squad you have aaron henry take over for ryan walters as the defensive coordinator, we all projected there would be a drop, right? When you have that much NFL talent move on to the next level, you can understand that. But you still had Johnny Newton, and you still had Keith Randolph, and you still had that drop. Now you lose those two big bodies on the defensive line. What does Illinois need to do in Aaron Henry's second season as the defensive coordinator to be able to take steps back forward, maybe approach more of that 2022 production on defense? Uh, you're not going to. The talent level on the defensive <laughs> line just isn't there to replace a guy like Newton and Randolph. But of all the positions on Illinois, defensive line is probably the weakest uh, and the thinnest when it comes to depth. Nobody, You're hoping that nobody gets hurt because right now, as is, it's probably an average, maybe below average if I take my Illinois cap off uh, when it comes to their counterparts in the conference. But should you lose a guy, then all of a sudden you're talking about you know, talent that I don't know is ready to play at the Big Ten level. So the defensive line, I would argue it might be the key to going bowling next season. If that's a room that starts getting hurt, then Illinois might be in trouble. You look at that defensive line, Dennis Briggs and Tara Edwards are expected to fill in up front. What would you say does Illinois, what do they need to do up front on the defensive line to compete in the trenches in the Big Ten this season? Well, they, I mean, they need to get to the quarterback because, you know, as positive as I was about the offensive side of the football, the defensive side is where all the question marks uh, are. And it starts with the defensive line, but also when we get to cornerbacks, it's back there too. There, we lost a lot of talent in the cornerback room, and I'm not sure the talent is ultimately there to replace it. So the only way you can make a cornerback's job easier is if the defensive line is getting to the quarterback. And so, you know, you talk about Briggs Jr., who uh, I believe we got from Florida State. Yeah, I think he's a sixth or seventh year guy. Lots of college football experience, but also a lot of experience being injured. So again, you talk about just keeping those guys healthy. As long as they can keep you know, attacking the quarterback and not giving him four, five, six seconds to make a throw against that inexperienced quarterbacks, you know, they, can, they might be the key to the season this year. 
Boy, generating pressure on the defensive line. That's what everybody pays a lot of money for in NIL these days. That's why they're backing up half a million dollars to defensive tackles in the transfer portal um, here this offseason as well. Let's take a look at the linebacker room. I think there's some things to get excited about. You had some concerns on the D-line. You look to the middle. I think now there's some things maybe moving back towards the positive direction. You look at Seth Coleman, Gabe Ackes coming back as well. Is this the best position group, would you say, on the Illini defense? Uh, I would say so, definitely. You have at least two future NFL players. Uh, you've got, if you believe some of the insiders, a lot of SEC teams trying to, you know, coerce some of these guys to go play for them with big dollar figure uh, totals. But they've decided to stay at home. They trust Brett and what they're kind of building here in Champaign. Again, you talk about guys like Seth Coleman, Gabe Jackis, just really outstanding players who I think when you hear about the Illini uh, this upcoming season, you you knew about Randolph and Newton last year. I think you're going to be hearing the names Seth Coleman a lot next year. I think you're going to be hearing the names Gabe Jackis a lot next season just because they are the two guys who can terrorize the quarterback from the linebacker position, and they're going to need to just to kind of make up for – the lackluster uh, units uh, in front and behind them. And Gabe's kind of a bigger guy. You've kind of seen him line up on the, the edge of that defensive line as well. So maybe moving some guys around in that group on defense could certainly keep offenses on their toes and really be able to generate that pressure that we talked about on the defensive line. The secondary interests me, right? Because that was a group when you rewind to 2022 that was my there was a really good defense there was a lot of really good parts but that was just probably the strength of the defense that particular season it seems like a healthy matthew bailey is the key for illinois to be better on that end because he was not available last year and i think right from the get-go that seemed to hurt them, especially that early season game against Kansas where the Jayhawks were able to move the football up and down the field. That's when really that part of the defense, you could even say the week before against Toledo as well, but really that game against Kansas, that's where that weakness um, was really exposed for Illinois last season. How big is Matthew Bailey's return to this orange and blue defense? I mean, he could be the most important player on that defense. Um, His absence last year was felt, like you said, we lost a lot of star players to the NFL. Three picks in the top 70 uh, from the secondary alone. And Matthew Bailey was going to be a team captain, and the expectation was he would kind of take over and be that vocal guy in the – not just the locker room, but on the field to you know direct some of the younger talent in that secondary. Him not being there really messed things up in that secondary. Now that he is coming back, you know, we're going to count on him. Again, you know, injuries is key. If he stays healthy, all of a sudden you have a safety spot, which is a very much above average. Then you have a guy like Terrence Brooks, uh, new, uh, the transfer that they just got from Texas, you know, all big uh, 12 honorary, a very talented, you know, quarterback. And so at least if the secondary is young, which it obviously is, if you have those two veteran presences out there, that kind of at least raises the floor a little bit because there's a lot of good offenses coming into the uh, Big Ten this year. And our schedule is not really going to be all that easy, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. So those two guys need to be healthy, Matthew Bailey in particular. The staff loves him. The staff was heartbroken when he had that season-ending surgery uh, last season because they know just how important he can be. Cool. Uh, We know about the Scots. Miles and Xavier also within this defense and how big of a deal they are. 100 tackles, 10 pass breakups, and four interceptions last year. And we know how big of a part that they are to this defense. But really at corner, I think, is where maybe some concerns start to pop up. You kind of started to talk about that a little bit. What do you think we can expect from the corner spot um, this season at Illinois? Well, it's tough because you lost your two projected starters. You know, and Zachary Tobe and um, what's his name? Oh, Taz Nicholson. Uh, you know, you lose your two projected starters. Of course, the concern is going to be there. But then you get a guy like Terrence Brooks. Uh, you know, a guy who played very well for a normal football player. Maybe not Texas level good, but you don't need to be Texas level good in order to be a starter here at Illinois. And so. Brooks' presence there is going to be something that hopefully will help the Scots. The Scots are very solid football players uh, themselves. Um, 
Miles himself is going to be a starter on one end. But, again, it's just going to – I wouldn't say it's a strength of the team. The offense is clearly going to be the strength of the team. Uh, the defensive line and the cornerbacks, they're going to have to work together. The defensive line is going to have to put some pressure on the quarterback so that there's not pressure on the cornerback side because otherwise, no matter how good our offense is going to be, it's not going to be able to put up 35, 40 points a game if that's what the defense is giving up. From a personnel standpoint and a roster standpoint, this seems to me like an improved team from last season, even though they do lose some key players in key spots. But when you start to look at the schedule, that maybe starts to question whether this team can make a bowl game, right? Kansas is on the schedule. We know how prolific they can be with Jalen Daniels coming back. They get it in Champaign this year. They have to go on the road to Nebraska, on the road to Happy Valley to play Penn State, Michigan at home and at Oregon. That is not an easy group of teams right off the bat. And then, of course, you have some of those uh, rivalry games against the Northwesterns and against the Purdue's of the world. Which games are must-wins on the Illinois schedule if they want to get to bowl eligibility? I think the key games to really look for is going to be, first off, that Kansas game. You know, as I mentioned, we got boat race last year on national TV. And Kansas and Illinois had head coach openings at the same exact time. And it was long rumored that Lance Leipold was actually going to be the guy that Illinois was going to hire. Ultimately, they went with Brett, but you kind of, you can compare the two teams side by side. Kansas, now granted, Kansas is doing a lot of it with less miles as players. So it'll be interesting to see that as more of Lance's players come in, uh, how Kansas tends to, uh, how they'll kind of adjust. But this game is going to be important because if all of a sudden Kansas wins by two touchdowns again in Champaign, there's going to be a little cause for concern. You know, Kansas, as good of a program as they maybe can be, that's who Illinois needs to compare themselves to. You need to be, if you're a serious Big Ten team, you need to be able to beat the teams like Kansas. Um, you know, we have a gauntlet of a schedule, as you mentioned. I think there's a four-game stretch where we play Oregon, Michigan, uh, and Penn State, you know, mix it with Purdue mixing uh, over there. We have to win the game against Purdue. You know, it's a rivalry game. We got embarrassed by them last year. Another game I'm looking at is that Nebraska game, only because it's earlier on in the season. You're going to have a freshman quarterback. Obviously, Nebraska seems to have a cakewalk for the first seven games or so. If you can maybe rile up Dylan Riola and, you know, you can try to maybe they look overlook you and try to steal a game then. Yeah, you look at those rivalry games. That's what sticks out to me, the Purdue and the Northwestern games. I don't think those yeah. are any pushovers this season. Uh, and we, we, you mentioned the results from last season. So to get to bowl eligibility, it seems like those have to be victories. What would you say is considered success? Because last season, regular year, they went 5-7. and seven. In theory, you need to get to the postseason. In theory you need to get to a bowl game. Is 6-6 six and six the barometer for success, or does it need to be higher than that? Uh, in short term, absolutely. That's it. Um, you know, again, Josh talked about this at the media roundtable. We're so just a couple games away from having the best stretch in Illinois football history, and we just need to get to that consistent level. Get that six wins. You know, obviously the schedule's not doing you any favors this year. Next year is not uh, a lot easier, but – as long as you set six wins as your baseline, and then you really start, you know, now you're talking about Brett Bielema's guys, you know, being in the third, fourth years, like those offensive linemen were 320, 340 pounds, all starting. Instead of relying on the transfer portal, you're talking about like internally developed players. I think that's when you can start thinking about, hey, let's hit eight wins now. You know, let's get to nine wins. But right now, baseline, you know, for the program that we are as is, is instead of five, eight, five, let's just keep winning six games and uh, getting to postseason play. And for a team like Illinois to get to six wins against the schedule, going to need to win some of those close games. Been saying that a lot this offseason about a lot of different teams. Sonny Verma from Locked on Illini should be a fun season in Champaign. Thanks for joining me, Sonny. Thanks for having me, Ted. Thanks for watching Big Ten Ted, where it's all Big Ten all year long. Make sure to like the video to spread the word of Big Ten Ted to the masses and subscribe to the channel for updates on Big Ten content that drops every day.